Look at the Boston players smiling. But Michael Jordan is not only the best basketball player, but he's the most exciting basketball player to ever play. 51 for Jason Tatum. The Big 3 NBA podcast is powered by Prize Picks, the exclusive daily fantasy partner of the CLNS Media Network. The Boston Celtics are officially heading to the NBA Finals. You're listening to the Big Three NBA podcast with Ashrod Blakely, Gary Washburn, and Kwani Lunas. Guys, they swept the Indiana, Indiana Pacers. Let's just recap the series overall. What do you think was the biggest takeaway as they head to the NBA Finals? They made it. And they made it in, in, in almost no significant amount of time relative to the rest of the NBA. I mean, you know, to go through, you know, the, the multiple series that they've gone through, three series, and, and to only lose two games, it's very impressive. Uh, they didn't, and it, it, I think the scary part for most of the NBA at this point is that the Celtics have been able to win, and you really don't feel as though they played one of their best games. You don't feel as though you're getting that Celtics team that smashed teams by like 50 points in a regular season. You feel like you're getting a good version of the Celtics, but you you haven't really seen the good, good version of the Celtics, which again, for them, it's perfect because you want to be trending in the right direction as far as how you're playing. And that's exactly what they're doing. You don't want to peak too soon. Uh, and, and the way that they plan, clearly they've got room to get better, room to grow. And yet they're still finding ways to manufacture victories in, along the way. And it, it says a lot about this team. It says a lot about Joe Mazzula and that coaching staff. Uh, and they are exactly where you'd want to be at this point in the season. Yeah, I think it's a, an example that they have learned from their past failures and the shortcomings and some of the bad things that have happened over the last playoff years, going 12 and 2. And as I remember, as I recall, keep repeating that great 08 team that everybody said was the greatest, one of the great, they went 16 and 10 in the playoffs. By the time they got to the finals, um, they had already lost eight times they were 12 and eight entering the nba finals the celtics are 12 and two so uh this this year celtics 12 and two now obviously the competition was better um they faced some great teams they faced lebron all that all right, so i'm not saying that their team was worse but i'm just saying put in perspective the 08 team the one that everybody talks about lost eight playoff games at this point so the celtics are finding ways to win and they're like, well, Indiana could have been up 3-1. Well, they weren't because they couldn't execute. Just like the Celtics could have been up 3-1 in the finals in that game four, and they didn't execute. And they didn't execute in the, in the game six either, like, or game five. Like, the, the, what separates the good teams from the great teams is execution down the stretch. And the Celtics, for years, did not have that, did not have that execution. And now they do. And I think... That just says a lot about their growth, um, the presence of Drew Holiday, the improvement of Jalen Brown, the playmaking of Jason Tatum, Derek White. I mean, all those guys, Horford. So I just take away from the first two, three, sorry, two rounds. I'm sorry, three rounds, my fault. Three rounds that this team knows how to win. And 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 we'll see how they adjust, because obviously it's going to be the ultimate challenge in the finals, whether it's Dallas or Minnesota, likely Dallas. But to me, you can't, you know, if 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 they had smashed all their opponents, everybody would say, well, they, they smashed them all. So what? They go to a competition. They, they don't know how, they won't know how to execute down the stretch. And then they went close games. Well, you should have blown Indiana out. It was Mr. Hellberg. Like, it's, there's no winning for this team because look at the other teams. Minnesota's got their flaws, its flaws. Dallas looked terrible in their first round. First game one against the Clippers. They got blown off the floor. Um, they got blown off the floor and lost in game one against Oklahoma City. Like, they've had all their flaws, too. So the Celtics, you know, got blown out once, that Cleveland game. The, the Miami game, they were highly competitive. The Miami had that record-breaking three-point night. But to me, Celtics have handled their business. Now they get more than a week off, chill, practice, reflect. And I think like how Horford pointed out, and I kind of forgot, like they won that game in Miami. And I think that my, I forgot if that was a Friday or Sunday, but it was like game one was Thursday in, in San Francisco. Like they had to, they had to basically go home, get their stuff and then travel the next day to San Francisco for like 
media day, I want to say it was like a Thursday or whatever it was. Um, so they didn't have any time to, to, to decompress, get healthy, reflect, relax, nothing. They had to go play the Warriors. This time, they got some practice time, Get try to get Porzingis back. But to me, taking care of your business, TCB. And you youngsters don't know what that means. That's something we, me and Sherrod grew up with. TCB. TCB. Taking care of your business. Taking care of business. Look at Business. Taking care of business. <laughs> yes, sir. All right. Jalen Brown named the Eastern Conference Finals MVP. Gary, you actually had a vote and voted for Jalen Brown. I think this one will be less controversial than your Carmelo one, but. <laughs> Wait, no, well done, to, Well to. done. Well wow. done. Wow. You got to bring that up. <laughs> I had to. Every few months we have to bring it up. That's me. That but, one dude. <laughs> were you too surprised? Because, to, I mean, obviously, Gary, you may not, you voted so you wouldn't be as surprised, but were you, Sherrod, at least surprised that Jalen won? Uh, I'm surprised that he's, as he said, he was too. He was like, I don't win, bleep. <laughs> A, a little bit, uh, only because it wasn't that I didn't think he deserved it. I just didn't think he'd get the credit for what he did. I mean, you I'm look at you. his numbers in those four games. He averaged damn near 30 points, five rebounds, three assists, shot 51.7% from the field. He did everything for that team uh, in, in, his, in his four-game sweep and clearly was the best player uh, overall. Tatum had moments where he was really good and, and reminded us why he's such a special talent. But in terms of elite consistency, Jalen Brown was the best player on this team. I mean, Jalen shot better at least 50% from the field in all four games. I don't know if Jalen has ever had a four-game stretch in his NBA career where he shot that well from the field over a four-game period of time. So surprised that he got the credit for it, but not surprised in, in, in him uh, deserving it. If that makes sense. No, I agree with you. Gary, what made you vote for him? Well, it was close. I mean, I was talking with another reporter in the press box, and we were both going, like, well, who are you going to vote for? What's Like, it basically came down to who had the better game in game four was probably going to get the vote. And then Tatum was playing well, but then Jalen hit that three, uh, early three, because it was 89-82. Remember, they, they had to... Uh, Jalen had hit that step back three off Miles Turner, and uh, during the timeout, they said it was after the shot clock expired, so they took it back. So the Celtics were down seven. It was like, oh boy, I, you know, I thought then they were done. Like, damn, they're down seven. They're not gonna make it up. But then Jalen came right back and hit another three, making four points. And then just his playmaking, that block on Nimhard, and then that drawing in, sucking in the defenders and passing to Derek White in the corner. Um, to me, that was the plays. He won them. He was he was the reason why they were able to win game one with that three-pointer. Game two, he came back with a 40-piece. Game three, he was okay, solid. Um, that was more Tatum game. Then game four, he just made the, the winning plays. So Tatum, I mean, if he had won, I would have had no problem with it. It was five to four. Um but I just felt like Jalen had just made those decisive winning plays when the game counted to lift the team because this was a close series, even though it was a sweep, and Jalen was responsible for essentially three of the wins. I mean, if you look at his numbers, um, which I've done, 29.8 points, uh, five rebounds, three assists, two steals, 51% from the field, 37 from the three-point line. Tatum, 30.3, 10.3 rebounds, 6.3 assists, uh, 1.3 steals, but 46% from the field and 30.6% from the three-point line. So Jalen had more steals, better shooting percentage, better three-point percentage um, than, than, than Jason. So, and then I just put, so it's close, but then you put those winning plays. Mm -hmm. And to me, um, that was that was what put him over the top. Yeah, and that was a separator between those two. The fact that Jalen made significant impact plays. Uh, Tatum is is going to get you 25 points in his sleep. Uh, he's that damn good. But a lot of the points that he was getting really weren't game-changing, game-altering 
putting the Celtics over the top type plays. And Jalen made a lot of those plays and made them at both ends of the floor. And that, when you talk about someone as the MVP, whether it's MVP of a game, of a series, of a league, those that's what you have to do. You have to put your imprint on games in winning fashion. And Jalen did that at a, just a consistently high level, uh, much more so than Tatum did. There have been jokes and memes and, you know, people create their own narratives of, how Tatum may have felt about not winning, but I imagine this would stoke up a flame in him to want to perform at an even higher level in the finals, right? Oh, Tatum's going to be finals it's MVP. Yeah. I'm going to say, right, Tatum's going to be finals MVP, and he's, he's going to earn it. He's going yeah. to have the stats to back it up. He's going to have the game to, to, to be that, that dude because – he knows that he's supposed to be the face of the franchise. And Robin, his sidekick, showed him up. <laughs> Jalen was better. And, and the thing about it is there's nothing, if you're Tatum, you can't hate on him for that because he yeah. was better than you. Yeah, He was absolutely better than you. So um, I think J- I think Tatum is going, to, we're going to see the best version of Jason Tatum in this series. There's no, yeah. I, I have very, very little doubt about that. Yeah. Moving Oh yeah, I agree. I mean, <laughs> He's like, I, you know. I, I think Jason could have won it, but I also think there's inherently Jason is happy for Jalen. I think he understands how hard Jalen works, and Jalen's been through some, you know, and we can talk about that. The criticism, not making an All NBA team, and the stuff with Stephen A. Smith, that you know, really it was unnecessary to me, uh, unnecessary, and people want to. Tend to point out a lot of Jalen's faults. Oh, Jim, he's left hand, he's trash, he's left hand, you know, he, yeah. this, that, the other. And, and the dude is a ball player. He's a ball player. He's got some mean, he's got a dog in him. And I, I think they they are there's never been a time in their together in their time together that they blended together so well as they have right now. And just along those same lines, Gary, the one thing that I think has jumped out in this in this particular series. Uh, is Jalen's leadership. Uh, when you see this, the, just the conversations that the cameras are panning on to in the locker room after games, you listen to what some of the guys are saying about him. When he was mic'd up for the one game where, you know, he's he's trying to keep Tatum. Tatum was having a rough, not so great game, and he was saying, hey, you, big deuce, we need you to do this, big deuce. Little things like that uh, that show his growth as a leader. And I think it was your question in one of the postgame uh, pressers where he talked about, having Marcus Smart move on and how he wants to fill that void from a leadership standpoint. It hits a little different when the arguably the set first or second best player is taking on that role as a leader versus one of your better players, which was the case with Marcus Smart. Um, Jalen's ability to just take that burden on himself, it rings, it has a it has a much more substantive feel about it for these players. Because you know that, yeah, he's saying that he's he's on me and wants accountability, but he is like dropping 40 in a damn playoff game. He is, you know, killing it at both ends of the floor. Maybe I should just kind of step my game up because he's clearly stepped his game up. It he's finally we finally figured out how this is gonna work. Jalen has to be, I think, that vocal leader that Jason Tatum, I just think don't think is built to be. And that's not a knock on Tatum, that's just who he is. At the same time, Jalen is comfortable enough in who he is to go out there and be a dominant player, but still make sure there's room for Tatum to do what he do. Uh, And and it feels as though these two have finally figured out the the cheat code for how they can coexist and be incredibly dominant players on the same night uh, in the same game and lead this team to where they are now. And that's four wins away from Banner 18. As the NBA and NHL seasons start to wind down, things are just heating up in the WNBA and on the baseball front. There's no better time than now to join Prize Picks, America's number one fantasy sports app with more than 5 million active members. With Prize Picks, you can turn $10 into $1,000 in a single game watching your favorite sports team this summer. You can make a prize pick lineup in as little as 60 seconds. You just need to pick more or less on two to six players, stat projections, and you're locked in. For me, one of my go-to guys has been Jason Tatum of the Boston Celtics, who, when it comes to rebounding, I'm going more almost every time. 
He was great for me during the Eastern Conference Finals against Indiana when he reached double-digit rebounds in three of the four games. That's what I'm talking about, JT. Download the app today and use code CLNS for a first deposit match up to $100. That's right. Just download the app today and use code CLNS for a first deposit match up to $100. Pick more, pick less. It's that easy. Jerry, you mentioned the Jalen Brown, Stephen A incident. I guess we should talk about it because Stephen A, for those that don't that didn't hear about it, Stephen A cited an anonymous store saying that people don't like Jalen Brown because he's not marketable and he has a big ego, which from I think the three of us would agree that we've never really seen that. I don't know what the story and he Jalen actually quoted it asking Stephen A to state his source and then Isaiah Thomas. Detroit Pistons, not Celtics. He gets on Twitter and starts defending Jalen. So what do you do make of this incident in general? But it just feels like a distraction, to be honest. Yeah, Gary, you talk to him about it. What do you, what do you got? Yeah, do yeah I mean, I feel like, I feel like, how do I put this? I think ever since Jalen entered the draft, he's a very smart kid. He's a kid who, I mean, and I'm, you know, this is my alma mater. He's a kid from Atlanta that went to Cal. Okay, like, that only happened once or four with Sharif Abdul Rahim. Who went right? to the same high school as Jalen. Yeah, like and went from Atlanta to go to UC Berkeley. That just don't happen. Jalen's a thinker. I think he, you know, he 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 is just a guy, you know, where guys are going to Cancun and going to all these. He's going to like Africa. He's going to Egypt. He's learning about the pyramids. He's going to Spain. He's going, he's learning different cultures. He's learning different philosophies and ways of life. He practices Ramadan. I think he has a lot of things on his mind. You know, when he said he wanted to help the um, men to bring together and close the disparity gap, wealth disparity gap between blacks and whites in Boston. Like, who says that? How many people say that? Right? I mean, he's got a lot on his mind. He's got the world on his shoulders. And I think that since he's entered the draft, that's rubbed some people the wrong way. You know, some people like their ball players not all that damn smart, right? And I just think, and let's be honest, that's how it is. And you, you can talk about if it's a race thing or whatever. But some people like their ball players just to, just just to be about ball. I mean, I think that's maybe why a certain quarterback who stood on his knee, you know, stood at the you know, knee at the anthem, is still is was never got allowed back to the NFL. So. I think that that is what intimidated certain people. I think if you are looking for someone to be smiling in your face and shaking your hand, Jalen's not that guy. Jalen can be intimidating. Um, if you look at him and you want to be buddies with him or whatever, you know, sometimes you got to talk his language, you know, and it's not rap music and it's not, you know, how's it? it's not Kendrick against Drake. It's not some of the things that maybe get other guys his age going. And so I understand what his the perceptions of him has been uh, over the years. He's a guy who came out of college and did not hire an agent for full three, until his new, until uh, his first rookie deal. He went without an agent. Why should I pay an agent? I'll just hire somebody pro bono and just to negotiate. This ain't that hard. Like that's what, that pisses some people off because he's going against the grain and Jalen's been that guy. And so I do think that there's people that probably think negatively of him or think he's a know-it-all or he thinks he's all that or he thinks he's smarter than everybody else or smarter than people. But I didn't understand the concept of bringing that up randomly from a quote-unquote NBA source, which is very vague. Um, the day before the final game. You know, and then just, you know, and I said, like, and I don't think Stephen A feels that way. I think he was trying to add some perspective into the conversation and it probably. And it was hurtful because Jalen, as much as we can, you know, he's 26 years old, 27 years old. I'm like, you know, like when someone says something about you at, when you get to a certain age, you don't care. But when they say something about you, 27, you're like, what'd you say? What you talking about? Why you say that about me? What's up with that? Like, you know, we've seen the sensitive athlete. Kevin Durant is mad sensitive. Like, there's grown athletes who are extremely sensitive to what people say about them. So I, I think it was an unfortunate incident. I know Stephen A has said, hey, I didn't say that about him. I think the world of him, and we continue to talk about him. That was just one thing I brought up. But when 
you bring up something that someone said anonymously, you know, it's like someone saying, if anybody said about us, yeah, Kwani, someone told me you woo woo woo, but I ain't gonna tell you who it is. And you know, I'm like, not gonna you, and I don't feel gonna, that way, but I'm just saying this is what I they don't say. feel that way. And I'm not gonna tell you the perspective, I'm not gonna tell you if they're close to you. You know, we've all had that. Somebody, you know, someone said woo woo, and you found out who it was. It's like, I don't even talk to that person. Yeah. Like, like I've never like I've had two conversations with that person, and they're like saying that I'm this, like. We've never even had a, we've never even talked for more than three minutes. Like, how are they making a statement about me? So I understand where Jalen was coming from. Um, and he probably needs to just get over it because I don't think it's that important. But I, I think that's a testament to what he feels like throughout his career. People have been, you know, criticizing him, not making all NBA, always being kind of the number two guy, the Robin on this team. And, I think he respects J- Jason. I don't think he blames Jason at all, but I think he's like, how come I don't get some of that, some of that piece yeah. of that pie either? You know, I'm a marketable guy, but also I think if it's like, well, Jalen, we want you to advertise this product. He's probably like, well, I don't use that. I'm not advertising that. Or what's how, how much you go, how much money are you gonna contribute to the boys and girls clubs of Roxbury? And they're like, nothing. Well, I ain't t- we ain't gonna talk about because yeah. Jalen was there. When they put that Kobe Bryant court, he showed up to the girls, boys and girls club of Roxbury a couple of months ago to dedicate the Jalen Brand. I mean, uh, the Kobe Bryant court, the Kobe and G- Gianna Bryant which court. People were mad about, you know, huh? I said, which some people were mad about because yeah, so like, oh, we put a Kobe court in Boston. Like, like all right, wait, get over like, you gotta be kidding me. So, um, I think Jalen's just, I think he's putting all this together and using it as fuel, using it as motivation. But I also think it's unfortunate because I think it's unfair to him. Some of like just some of the criticism Jason's face has been unfair. This playoffs, you know, and 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 there have to be conversation pieces. There has to be guys that are always going to talk about things. And that's just the society that we're in today that someone's someone out the blue has got to have a comment. Like you just got to talk about something, even though you don't know a lot about it. You just got to have your two cents. Like, I remember when Sherrod and I grew up, it was like, don't talk about stuff you don't know about and don't put your two cents in, you know, unless you really, really, really defend your opinion. Don't just say something to say something. Don't put your two cents in like that, especially you don't know what you're talking about. But now people, everybody with social media, everybody has an opinion. Everybody who's an insider. (laughs) Everybody knows what they're talking about. You got insiders who haven't even been in arenas, but they insiders. It's like the Ch- Chappelle skit where it's like, who wants to hear what Ja Rule thinks? Like, nobody yeah. cares. But it's everybody. like it one person, this insider, was criticizing the crowd at the TD Garden for game two because it wasn't loud enough. But I know. But yeah. wasn't at the game. Watched it on TV yeah. and said, the, the crowd at TD Garden's got to step up. They was quiet. You know what ESPN does that TNT doesn't? ESPN suppresses the crowd sound. So it doesn't sound as loud. How you going to criticize a crowd, crowd noise, and you weren't at the game? That's different, yeah. Like, you weren't even there, man. Yeah. Like, how you, but that's what we're doing here. Mm-hmm. That's what we're doing. People are it's crazy. a way of trying to be relevant, really. Not, not without an apology. No apologies. No, hey, my bad, I wasn't there. You know, you know, it's just like people, I want, you know, like when people get, uh, like, oh, well, were you at the incident? No, I wasn't. I didn't happen to me, but my I was, cousin said I, mean, I was emotionally scarred by watching it. So I'm very, I, I'm so, I'm filing a lawsuit. Like, you weren't even there, man. Like, what, where was you at? Well, I wasn't there. I came there later, but what I, you know, that you're an expert. Like, no, you're not an expert. So it's just sad that that's how it is. And that's what these young athletes have to deal with. Everybody's an insider. Everybody has a comment. And no one apologizes and says, hey, I didn't know what I was talking about. Or I had some bad information, you know. So Jalen just needs to move on, look forward to the finals. And I think he will. <laughs> 
The NBA Finals have finally arrived and will once again be one of the hottest tickets in sports. You want to be there and not have to mortgage the family home or take a second job to do so, right? Game Time makes getting NBA Finals tickets even faster and easier. Prices on the Game Time app actually go down the closer it gets to the tip-off. With killer last-minute deals, all-in prices, views from your seat, and their lowest price guarantee, Game Time takes the guesswork out of buying NBA tickets. That's a huge get when it comes to the NBA Finals, which will start in Boston for games one and two. Those tickets are going to be super pricey. So waiting to the last minute and take advantage of the Game Time app makes a ton of sense. Here in Boston, every season is sporting season. So for me, the Game Time app makes it super easy to find tickets for just about every sport in my area, which is great this time of year when family or friends pop into town at the last minute and you're scrambling for something to do that won't break the bank. Like, you know, getting tickets to the NBA Finals. Game Time has you covered. So take the guesswork out of buying NBA Finals tickets with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code CLNS for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Create an account and redeem code CLNS for $20 off your first purchase. Download Game Time app today. Last minute tickets, lowest prices, guaranteed. And I, I think in many respects he has. I think one of the things that helps him deal with this type of stuff is the fact that he literally came, his birth into the NBA was getting booed on draft night. Mm -hmm. uh, and that, that is something that, you know, it is something that he has kept with him all these years later. Uh, I know, because whenever I have brought it up, he's like, oh, yeah, I remember. I I'll never forget that. And it it's understandable why. Uh, he's like many athletes. He's often trying to find that one little extra something that can give you that little added motivation to go out and be the best version of yourself. And Jalen never has a shortage of opportunities to do that uh, because he has often been second guessed and doubted and criticized uh, for things that just don't really make a lot of sense. Uh, Jalen is one of those players that is very comfortable with those around him being uncomfortable. Um, mm -hmm. He's not trying to proclaim, he's not trying to make sure that everyone around him is happy go lucky. That's not who Jalen Brown is. He's about his business. He is about uh, more than anything else, he's a thinker. And you don't have to agree with all that he's thinking about, but damn it, he is going to put thought into pretty much everything he does. And often what happens is that when you do that, you actually use this thing we like to call common sense and make decisions. And often that's not what people are going to judge you on. And so that's where the rubber meets the road, where he's making decisions. For example, as Gary pointed out, with the rookie salary scale, I never understood why players as rookies get agents because there's a scale for yeah, you make it, rookies. Yeah. You literally already know what you're going to get the moment you get drafted. Mm -hmm. uh, you know what the max is, you know what the minimum is, and you you, you can just kind of negotiate from there. Your agent, that's just agents, they steal money off that rookie contract. If we're being honest and real, Jalen gave us thought clearly and realized, why am I going to let this man steal money? for me when I can just have the services that they would provide for, for less money. It, it's just, that's just thinking it makes sense. So Jalen, to me, I, I love it when I hear the second guessing and the criticism, because I know for a guy that's always looking for that, he doesn't have to look far. Mm -hmm. And he shows time and time and time again, that he's one of the best players in the NBA. And as I, as I touched on earlier about Jalen, the thing that impressed me the most during his recent run is just his leadership. It was the one thing that I thought this championship squad absolutely needed someone to really grab the bull by the horns and take control and be that, that steady presence, that voice on and off the court. And as much as y'all know, I love me some Marcus Smart. That's my dog for life. He wasn't able to elevate the guys around him the way that a Jalen Brown can, even though they may have very similar messages and they may have very similar intentions. The fact that Jalen Brown can go out there and get you 40 and it not really be that big a shock is different than Marcus Smart going out there and get you 40, which I don't think has ever happened. Uh, and that ability to be an elite player, impact difference maker on and off the court, that's what separates him. And frankly, the fact that he's doing it in a way that, doesn't align itself with how 
many people in the media want him to do it. And, and, you know, folks who are looking to market athletes want him to carry himself. It rubs people the wrong way. It makes people wonder if he's just hard to get along with. It, it, I mean, and again, we can have a much deeper conversation about just the implicit biases that a lot of folks have towards Jalen Brown uh, based upon how they perceive athletes, particularly black athletes, are supposed to be and how you're supposed to act and how you're supposed to just fall in line because you should be thankful that you got this job making 300 million or 285, whatever number you want to use. The bottom line is this. Jalen is an individual and he is an uncompromising individual. Uh, he does not try to move at the beat that you set. He moves at the beat that moves him. And sometimes that rhythm is not one that most people can understand, comprehend, or embrace. And I personally like that about him. Um, there are some decisions that he makes that I don't agree with, but I respect the fact that the decisions he does make are well thought out. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and that, to me, ultimately makes for a better decision in the long run. So looking ahead to the NBA Finals, we still don't know exactly who the Celtics will be playing, but they'll most likely be playing Dallas which would be interesting because then we get the Kyrie Irving, Boston oh, Celtics. already started. Juicy already in itself. But one person that hasn't played since the April 29th game, which was against Miami, is Chris S. Porzingis. So it's not lost upon any of us that the Celtics have been able to get this far without one of their stars. So if he's not ready for the NBA Finals, which would start on June 6th, what is your level of concern that he might not even play in for the rest of the season, really? I would be a little concerned uh, because he has had and I mean, there was this period of time where they said, you know, the, there were reports that he might be able to play in the Indiana, in the Indiana series. Uh, and, you know, obviously after they went up three zip, you pretty much knew he wasn't going to play in game four. Uh, if he's not able to go now that he's had an additional week and some change to get his body right. And all they've been saying all along is that, you know, this is precautionary. This is precautionary. We have moved beyond precautionary because you are at the point where you literally, this is why you traded for him for the NBA finals. This is why he is here. And if he's not able to go, that is a major red flag that whatever he's dealing with, either it's worse than they've led us to believe, or there has been some type of setback that they're not being completely or even partially transparent about. And that has the potential to derail what has been an amazing season for this team. Yeah, you would like to think he'll be back for game one. You'd like to think that he's going to spend this week off working out, ramping up five on five, getting himself completely prepared to be in that starting lineup for game one. But we really don't know. I mean, he does walk normally. He's at shoot around. It's not like he's got a boot on. He's way past that. Um, we haven't really seen him work out in about a week. We didn't see him work out at all in Indianapolis. Not to say he didn't, but by the time we were allowed him to shoot around, you know, he was sitting there and he was done. So we don't really know what his status is in terms of like, oh, he's close. We keep hearing he's close. And I just think talking to a doctor about this injury, there was three uh, kinds of strains. And I think the most severe was four to six weeks. But I think what I keep hearing, it was the second most, which was two to three weeks. And now we're at four. And like Sherrod said, the fact that they're up three nothing, it's like, why are we going to throw them out there for 12 minutes in a high level game? Indiana's desperate. And he he hasn't done a whole bunch of five on five. That's foolish. Now you have a whole period of time practice where he can get his three on threes in, then get on his five on five and be up to par. Although he's not going to be in great basketball shape, it doesn't happen until you play in games. But at least he'll be ready to play maybe twenty minutes in game one, and then you get two days off, I believe, uh, before game two, and then he can get ramp up even more and be be probably 100% by then. So I don't think that um, it's a situation where I don't think he's going to play in the finals, but I do think it's getting to the point of like, okay, y'all, he's got to ramp up here. Like this is the time he needs to be doing sprints and figuring it out. If not, it is a worse injury than we than we were told 
We have not been told what kind of strain it is or what, what whether it's a third degree strain, second degree or first degree uh, strain or whatever. I think the second degree is what it is, but it could be a third third one, which would, which means he probably wouldn't be back at all or maybe late in the series. But I just think, quite honestly, that he is um, going to be ready for game one. Before we close out, let's look at the bench because obviously Jalen and Jason, Drew and Derek, they can only do so much. But Pritchard has had his moments of strong play throughout the playoffs. Hauser, uh, Sam Hauser, not necessarily. Brissett, Tillman, and Cornette have been a roller coaster of a ride. So, one, who do you guys think is a reserve that needs to have a big impact in the NBA Finals? Who you got, Gary? Um. I don't know what to make of Hauser, but he was terrible in the NBA. He was one for 14 from the three-point line in the Indiana series. Um, he averaged less than two points. You know, he just he, he made some mistakes in terms of killing some bad fouls. He got beat on defense. Um, you know, maybe it was just a bad stretch for him, right? But you need somebody to stretch the floor. You need a shooting out there. And if it's one, if you're going one for fourteen, there's it could be mental out there because he is just not even close to some of these wide open looks he's getting, and he makes everything so much easier for the Celtics when he's knocking down those three point point shots. So I'm kind of intrigued as to what they're going to do with him. Um, will they give um, Reset more playing time? I mean, he actually played 21 minutes in this series, and he was decent. He was a plus when he was on the floor, um, didn't score much, but was able to be active defensively, get a get a, uh, three steals in his 21 minutes. Um, but I'm Hal's is a guy that I'm concerned about um, because this is kind of what happened in, in, in pre sorry uh, playoff seasons, postseasons past, where he just kind of disappears. And he's not a factor. And he's not a defender or plus rebounder where, well, if he's not hitting shots, he can make other plays. I mean, he was able to get eight rebounds. So, you know, eight defensive rebounds, four assists, two steals, two blocks. But still, not nearly enough. He scored seven points in the series in 59 minutes. Like, that's just, and and I said, a lot of those open looks. Yes, in game four, he had a lot of, he hit one. And he hit a layup. I'm sorry, he got fouled a layup in a couple of free throws. But, it, it, you know, he's just been awful. And I don't know whether it's mental, schematic, where the defenses are. But he's got to start knocking down shots because he can really open up this offense if he could be a factor in the final. Yeah, I mean, I I, I agree with Gary. It, it, it has to be Hauser. He's the one guy on that second unit that you really when you look at what they did up to this point it's it's bad i mean others have had moments where they looked really good and others times they struggle hauser has not had any good looking moments in the postseason up to this point certainly not in the in the the uh you know in the conference finals against indiana and i don't think it's it was a schematic thing that indiana did because again as gary pointed out he had a lot of great looks uh, Tatum and Brown have the ability to force defenses and suck them in like a black hole and kick it out to him for wide open or lightly contested shots that he just simply did not knock down. It was mental. There is absolutely no doubt in my mind that what he was going through was a mental block that he has to get over. And the thing about guys like Sam Hauser is that the, you know, they're too good to stay in a slump forever. Uh, the law of averages tells you that they're going to go through a, a stretch where they're just not going to miss. Uh, with just like he's going through now, we're shot, we're stretched where he can't make a shot. So I expect him to be a significant impact performer in the finals because the law of averages says so. He's a guy that, and when when all is said and done, he's going to be shooting anywhere from high thirties, low forties from three point range. And for that to happen, he's probably going to have to be shooting on the north side of fifty percent for most of the finals, which is something that he has the ability to do, not only because of his talent but also because of the talent around him and their ability to create opportunities for him to knock down those type of shots. So I anticipate a big 
NBA Finals series from Sam Hauser and just simply because he's due and he's he's too good a shooter not to have a stretch like that. Well, by Tuesday evening, we'll know exactly who the Celtics will be. Well, we might know who the Celtics will be playing in the NBA Finals. She already got them swept. I know. And, I was like, and, wait a minute. It's like, like hold up. Anything is possible. <laughs> all, I know, all I know is I got an email from the, the Timberwolves saying that, that game, a limited number of Game 5 tickets are on sale. So they, they're ready. They, they expect <laughs> that dub in, in the okay. deal. <laughs> Interesting. I'm like, I, when I, I was just like, oh, really? Okay. There's a <laughs> refund with that, right? Look. <laughs> I'm just saying. I'm just saying. <laughs> right. That's a good point, actually. But until then, this has been a great kind of wrapping up of the – Series, the playoffs so far for the Celtics, obviously they've been doing a great, great run. So, of course, we're all looking forward to the NBA Finals. And we appreciate you guys sticking around with us here on the Big 3 NBA Podcast. So when we find out who they're playing, we'll be back. We'll debrief. We'll preview the NBA Finals formally. But until then, Ray Sean Blakely and Gary Washburn, I'm Claudia Lunas, and thank you for listening. 